Good morning from Washington, D.C., and welcome um, to week three of our virtual academic program, Developing Local Strategies to Power Violent Extremism in Africa. Again, I am Anwar Luhars, uh, Professor of Counterterrorism and Counter Violent Extremism, uh, and I will be moderating today's session uh, on implementing a local uh, CVE action plan. Last week, we discussed <clears throat> the key guiding principles in developing local CVE action plans. Our panelists, they explain the practical process and the steps of designing and drafting a local CVE action plan. They also shared some of the challenges faced to ensure that local CVE action plans uh, or CVE programs, you know, are holistic, they are inclusive and they are implementable. <clears throat> they highlighted also some of the critical lessons learned during the development processes <clears throat> of local CVE action plans. Today, in session three, we will discuss the implementation of local action plans for countering violent extremism. <clears throat> As we will hear, implementing local action plans necessitates multi-sectoral coordination between different state agencies and actors, uh, as well as non-state actors. Local action plans, they need to designate the roles and responsibilities of the institutions charged with carrying out objectives, as well as the mechanisms to coordinate their activities and decisions. Uh, certain roles are defined by legislation. Once the roles and the responsibilities are clearly defined, I mean, primary and secondary roles must be delineated. And often the coordination structures, as we will hear, include a multi-sectoral coordination committee that oversees the implementation of the local action plan. And this body, also referred to as a as local prevention network, is composed of representatives from national and local government, as well as other relevant stakeholders. And each year, each year, the local prevention network responsible for implementing the local action plan should create a work plan which sets out the outputs and the activities for how it will work towards you know, the goal and outcomes. So the implementation strategies for each activity can contain key performance indicators and verification methods. And all activities, as, as we will hear, you know, must also be fully funded. And even if resources are, are often scarce, local action plans should be mainstreamed into existing financial resources as much as possible. Uh, there are other funding options uh, that local action plans can tap into, <coughs> as Patricia uh, Rosby will elaborate. Uh, in, in a couple of minutes. In the end, whatever form a specific implementation plan takes, it must have flexibility and it must have adaptability built into it. Uh, and the document must also change, must, must also acknowledge the changing nature of the security landscape and provide relevant ministries and agencies with the resources to adopt and to react accordingly. So it's therefore critical to review and refresh these plans to incorporate lessons learned, changes in context, uh, and any changes in coordination structures or implementation plans. So to help us unpack all of this, you know, how local CVE action plans define responsibilities for its implementation, to help us explain the different funding streams for local action plans uh, and to share some of the common challenges during implementation and how to overcome them. We have three distinguished panelists with us today. Uh, <coughs> so Ms. Patricia Crosby uh, is a well, first uh, panelist and she's a countering violent extremism and governance specialist with strong experience and expertise working with governments and civil society, I mean, to develop programs, strategies, and action plans to address the underlying causes of violence. 
And uh, while at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, Patricia led the Strong Cities Network expansion in East Africa. She facilitated you know, learning exchanges and advocated for an inclusion of local governments in security policy development. She was also responsible for supporting multiple county governments, uh, county governments in Kenya to implement their action. Then we have Kimi uh, Okaniano, and she's the executive director of the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria, a non-governmental organization uh, dedicated to enhancing citizens' participation and improving security governance in Nigeria and West Africa broadly. And she's a member of the Governing Council of the National Human Rights Commission, Nigeria. She serves on the board advisory committee of various non-governmental organizations. She has over 90 years experience you know, in the justice and security sector, um, Nigeria and West African government issues and NGO management. And finally, we have Ms. Uh, Imen Uhidi, as he, uh, she's at the search for common ground. Um, she joined first as program director. Now she's country director. Tunisia, where she leads the development and implementation uh, of strategy and partnerships in Tunisia. She ensures the implementation of a very diverse portfolio and seeks to encourage um, active citizen participation in the processes of local and national governments. Uh, she works on trying to transform violent extremism and promoting the institutionalization of peace education. <coughs> And Imen is an expert in youth, gender, and local development. And she has held several decision-making positions in, in the administration and work with. She was a member of the cabinet, the Minister of Youth and Sports Affairs, Director General of National Youth Observatory. Um, she has served as a member of the Executive Office of the National Union of Tunisian Women, Deputy Mayor of the City of Tunis, Vice President of the Economic and Social Economic uh, Council, and the list goes on and on and on. <laughs> so now let's start the, the discussion, and I'll start with, uh, with Patricia. Uh, Patricia, I mean, government can be, you know, can be great at drafting documents, right? But implementation is, is usually problematic, and implementation is, is often complex. So based on your experience, I mean, can you explain to the participants you know, the process of launching a local CVE action plan and some of the challenges encountered. Patricia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amwar. And first of all, thank you for inviting me to this workshop. It's very exciting to see so many people interested in local action plans. The toolkit that Dominic and I produced uh, essentially began as a project report and turned into a bit of a, a labor of love. So I'm very happy to see that people are engaging and understanding the importance of localized and holistic approaches to CBE. So implementing an action plan, as I'm more rightfully said, is probably the most difficult uh, element of LAPs. So thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak on the most uh, important and difficult topic. And I would arguably say that properly launching and communicating an LAP is just as important as the actions themselves. We know that CVE can be very sensitive, sometimes polarizing, very complex, and sometimes stigmatizing. Therefore, having all community and government stakeholders aware of the contents is absolutely critical to securing support from beneficiaries and implementers. So some of the steps that we had done in our work was really starting with this initial formal launch event where you have your highest elected political representative, in the case of Kenya, this will be a governor, other places it might be a mayor or a premier, and also representatives from the security officials who would be there to formally launch this and inform the community and stakeholders of the content. But of course, this doesn't go far enough. Most people cannot fit in that same room. And a lot of your intended beneficiaries and community members would also feel uncomfortable engaging in that space. So then we would go on to do several rounds of different outreach to both implementers, and by implementers, I mean government, civil society, private sector, as well as the community and intended beneficiaries. Oftentimes, these outreach also include things like training or sensitization, so that people actually understood what CVE was and what this document was supposed to do. 
and also included very important information on accountability measures and how both government and non-government can be involved in that accountability. And of course, updates on the progress as the challenge goes on. Some of the challenges that we encountered were uh, primarily the first one would be around involvement of stakeholders in the drafting. It's very possible that you were not able to include as many stakeholders as you would have liked in the drafting period. And even if your community outreach was quite extensive, there'll never be people who felt left out. This is why it was very important to make every effort to reach as many people as possible. For example, in Kenya, the kind of so-called second generation county action plans or CAPS had quite large community stakeholder involvement in the drafting, but then there was no follow up during implementation, which made people feel alienated and separated from the process and many people distanced themselves, they even created some conflict between implementers and the community. Of course there's research resource constraints and i'll talk about this a bit later, but holding multiple community forums and events can be time and financially resource friend heavy. This is why we found that going to existing forums and meetings helped greatly. There will inevitably be existing or ongoing forums that you can integrate your LAP into the agenda, whether formally or informally. Some examples were in the Kuru County, we utilized existing peace and security CSO group to mobilize civil society and sensitize them on CV and the LAP. In Kuala County, we reach members of community by supporting chiefs to engage in routine and planned barazas with community members. And then in multiple Kenyan counties, we saw local implementing partners and uh, local officials or the MCAs to get uh, the LAP onto the agenda so that it raised awareness around elected officials of why it was important and why they should engage with it. Another challenge was lack of understanding about CVE. CVE is kind of a newer term and oftentimes people think CVE is very sensitive or a security matter. It does not impact them, it's not important for them. People often think that CV is also stigmatizing and can stigmatize their community. So challenging this framing is very important. So this is why we ensured that in all communications, they were in clear, simple terms. So everyone knew what the contents was and why this is a document owned by the whole of society and not simply the police or a couple of CSOs who were involved in its um, drafting. Trust, so CV is very politicized. And in many communities, there's also strong mistrust of the government and in particular security officials. So we actually use a lot of these um, CAP launches as a trust building exercise to help mitigate this challenge and actually build that trust just during the launch phase so that when we went on to the implementing activities, it was much easier because there was a baseline there. Finally, around accountability. So accountability mechanisms need to be very clear. And this needs to be communicated from the outset, both for beneficiaries of your local action plan, but also those who are involved in the implementations. So some of the ways that we, we supported partners and worked on this, um, in the Kenya example, there's what we call the community engagement forums, which were kind of set up as a, a subsect of the CAPS. And these forums involved, were chaired by the governor as well as um, the county commissioner, so the police commissioner, and involved civil society, faith-based groups, youth and women representatives, and so on. And these were ways to communicate about the progress of the CAP, but also coordination. I come together and agree on the way forward. Oftentimes these CEFs, however, kind of fell by the wayside. And I'll talk a bit about this later, but one of the ways we mitigated this was by creating clear roles and responsibilities for all of the members in this uh, CEFs or standard operating procedures so that there's a rationale for why everyone was engaged in this coordination form and who was doing what and who was responsible for what. When it came to government officials who were involved in the CEFs, we also sought out to integrate these roles and responsibilities into their performance reviews. So that for if example, if um, the county commissioner delegated his chairing responsibilities to one of their deputies, this official then actually had that written into their performance review. So when they went at the end of the year for the performance review in front of their supervisor, this was counted. So there was an added incentive to make sure that those accountability mechanisms were clear. 
Another example, which is actually outside of from CVE, but still in Kenya, is in the health sector and the use of scorecards. In creating simple scorecards that the community can then use to evaluate uh, a government policy in progress, it can be easily replicated. And again, it comes back to the launching and making sure that those accountability measures are clear from the outset and that everyone is aware of the role and responsibility of implementation. Excellent. Um, Tricia, again, the, the emphasis on how important it is to have you know, representatives from all stakeholders engaged throughout the process, uh, whether it's, as you said, local government officials, you know, the wider community, uh, as well as, as the media, obviously, at that launch event. Uh, uh, P, uh, CVE is, uh, as you said, a sensitive uh, topic, so it's uh, important to demonstrate that that this, you know, the policies is promoting, uh, you know, social cohesion and, and not stigmatizing or looking only at a subset community. Um, and that takes me to the, you know, second question as co-author of that toolkit, um, you know, that we assigned to the participants to read. I mean, can you explain how do you operationalize a local CVE action plan? And again, some of the challenges encountered and how they were overcome. Oh, certainly. And firstly, I just want to say there are definitely limitations to this toolkit. I personally think it's a great tool, but it is largely drawn on the Kenyan experience, which is very unique in the sense that there was an actually a national mandate to create um, local action plans or CAPs. So and I know this workshop was about the importance of local action plans, but I actually encourage people to look at ways, instead of creating a whole new document, to work together with existing entry points and existing structures and policies to see how to mainstream CVE to other streams of work, or maybe there isn't a strong political will to have a standalone document. Um, to speak a bit broadly about challenges, this is largely pulling on the Kenyan experience, but I would say these challenges are very relevant elsewhere in other countries where I've worked on local action plans. Some of the challenges about operalization were oftentimes these uh, local action plans can be very broad documents that don't actually have clear actions, they're more strategic. And this was certainly the case in the first generation CAPS in Kenya. There was great engagement from a robust number of stakeholders and community members, but they were very strategic documents. There wasn't clear actions, there wasn't clear responsibilities or a way forward. So some of the ways that these challenges were addressed by countries like Kuala and Mombasa who worked with the CES, the County Engagement Forums, to develop yearly work plans, which actually took that strategic idea and brought it down to reality with a very clear pathway forward. Another issue, and this is certainly the case in second and third generation CAPS in Kenya, but also in national action plans, is they end up being a laundry list of things without sustainability, listing a whole bunch of things that's a bit of a wish list but these actions aren't linked to budget cycles, to other county or national level processes or priorities that could help integrate them into other streams of work. So this means that sometimes these documents remain largely unimplemented sitting on the shelf. Again, work plans can really help with this. We saw in counties like Iziolo, really help them narrow down the actions, look at priority areas, and then identify entry points to make sure that these documents were speaking to other things that were happening in their locality. Another big issue, and I talked about this a little bit, is the lack of engagement with appropriate stakeholders and community members, both during drafting, but also kind of that launching phase. So in order to properly implement these actions, a broad sector stakeholders need to be involved, aware of, and bought into the CAP not just government, but also civil society and community members. So complete unawareness of um, local action plans definitely hindered this progress in Kenya, which is why continuous outreach is so important so that actions can be allocated to specific individuals and organizations to bring them forward. Uh, political will from elected officials and I, I've seen this elsewhere, but in the Kenyan case, the CAPs were seen by many, especially governors, as a national counterterrorism mandated document. And therefore, many elected officials, their MCAs and governors, distanced themselves from responsibility. They saw this as being a police matter, a security matter, and not, not their um, you know, periphery, even though this is not how it was intended at all. 
So we helped and worked and supported uh, stakeholders to slowly mitigate this, largely through strong advocacy, both within government and outside of government, to demonstrate why local action plans are both more than security and have impacts on other important sectors like health, education, and tourism. We did this a bit informally through, I would say, kind of CVE champions, but also high level events at national and local level that brought together key decision makers to impact on this. Another one is around the lack of policy frameworks, especially if you're looking at developing a local action plan where there isn't a national mandate, where there perhaps isn't even a national strategy or local um, <clears throat> framework. So while in Kenya, there was a national mandate for every county to have a cap, there was absolutely no mandate for there to be local legislation that facilitated implementation, which again meant that these documents were sometimes separated from what was happening within the local governments. Although some counties like Nakuru and Kalifi have addressed this by enacting peace and security policies at the local level, which included CVE and facilitated the caps being formally entered into county level legislation. It's also important to look at enacting or implementing legislation that supports CVE activities. This could be any community policing measures that you have already, access to justice, including alternative dispute mechanisms, anti-corruption mechanisms, and of course, inclusive socioeconomic policies in areas such as employment, healthcare, and education. While these are not necessarily CV specific, they all create environments which are conducive uh, for CAPS being implemented. Then, and I mentioned this slightly, but a lack of integration into existing processes. Um, in Kenya, and I'm sure this is the case in many countries, um, including my home country in Canada, there are a prolifera of bodies and structures um, at the local level. They often involve the exact same people, especially in smaller cities, states, or counties where you have multiple people sitting on different working groups, different committees, different forms. And this actually hinders implementation because everyone is so caught up in attending meetings that we never get to the point of actually implementing. So rather than creating a whole new form, look at how to integrate your local action plan into existing structures. So um, I referenced this above, but the example was how Nakuru County utilized existing peace forum, which had been set up following um, election violence and mobilized those same actors to address CVE and widen their kind of scope of work. So a lack of comprehensive drafting process. For third generation CAPS in Kenya were largely written by a couple consultants with very limited county level engagement which meant analysis and actions were not always relevant or even specific to that locality. This is also very much the case in national action plans, which are largely written by international consultants with involvement of local stakeholders. So some of the ways to kind of address this is actually to go back to the action plan, review the contents and update, not to overhaul, but to review and update and see how you can address this. Or from the very beginning, just make sure those that who are working on this, if they're a consultant or an academic, they're actually local to the city or sub-region you're working in and involve as many stakeholders as possible from the outset. Accountability measures, um, even when they existed, typically weren't kind of followed up on and many caps fell by the wayside and no one used them. So if you have accountability measures made in and roles and responsibilities, make sure that those are kind of integrated and that people are held responsible. So clear roles and responsibilities, as I said before, is absolutely important to making sure that these accountability measures work and that each action on an annual work plan is allocated to someone and they are responsible for it. Finally, and kind of linked to accountability, I would say um, a lack of monitoring. So most local action plans that I have seen a very loose or even no kind of monitoring and evaluation plans. People often get scared by m and &E, but it is actually very simple and possible to create simple monitoring frameworks and have people act on this. But you also need to remember who, who is collecting that data and who is inputting. So I think a case from Isiolo County, they created a very simple and great way by having the thematic pillar heads collect the data and report on progress and as well as impact. But the problem was while these people were very well placed to collect that information, 
they oftentimes didn't have access to reliable internet or didn't have a home computer to actually input this data and report on it. So we have one of our partners, Isiolo PeaceLink, who went out of their way and provided their office as an open space for people to come in and use their IT equipment or to go to the people directly to gather that information so it could then be recorded properly and lessons learned could be integrated into next versions of action plans. Okay, excellent. Um, again, the importance of integrating plans into existing structures and involvement of as many <clears throat> stakeholders as possible, as possible, you know, clear roles and, <clears throat> and responsibilities. And I like to, the idea about the creation of a yearly work plan. Now each activity should be, or should have its own set, uh, as you referred to in that toolkit of SMART goals. And SMART is specific, measurable, achievable, <clears throat> relevant, and time-restricted goals. And these needs to be reviewed <clears throat> you know, at the end of every year. And all activities should be implementable, <clears throat> again, within existing um, resources. So it's better to list, as, as you said, instead of a laundry list, just list a few activities which can be completed right, to a high degree of, of quality uh, so that stakeholders do not lose faith in the local action plans, as you call it, the lab local action plans. Um, and the, this takes me to the final question to you, Patricia, is can you share with the participants some of the key lessons you know, learned, including funding for effective implementation of a local CVE action plan? If you can provide some examples, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. I think I would start with kind of looking at the challenge of competing priorities both from donors as well as elected officials. Um, you know, this is lesson learned that CV work is still very donor funding heavy dependent. And all donors, of course, have their own priorities, um, their own strategies and their own ways of working. And of course, all locally elected officials or nationally elected officials also have their own priorities, strategies and ways of working. So oftentimes we found that one donor funder project was doing the exact same thing as another. There was a lot of duplication. Sometimes even the same individuals were some attending the same trainings. Um, or in cases, we often found that a government program was actually doing an action from the local action plan, but this wasn't being recorded or noted because these two things were happening uh, separate from each other rather than kind of coordinated and brought together. So some of the ways to overcome this lessons learned was a lot of effort to lobby donors to coordinate more. Of course, there's an extent, certain, you can't, you know, they, they always will push back, but, you know, strong lobbying against donors to make sure there is coordination and there isn't duplication. Also strong due diligence around the projects we were supporting, especially at the community level, to make sure the projects that we were supporting and funding were aligned with local priorities, and uh, framed in a way to the donors that this made sense and there wasn't duplication. But there's also a lot of advocacy to um, MCAs and governors around how to integrate CVE into other important portfolios like health and education, which the government was responsible for. And of course, tracking the government work. One of our colleagues in Isiolo did a lot of work on this, looking at the government budget, looking at government plans and the programs that are being implemented and tracking uh, which was coming from the local action plan and then raising awareness with government officials that, hey, look, we're actually wanting to do the same thing. How about we make sure we align our priorities a bit more? So, and then of course the lack of funding. This is always the biggest one and I think challenge because everyone always says, especially government officials, you know, I have other priorities. Uh, I have hospitals, I have schools I need to take care of. Why should I be um, investing in CVE? This isn't my periphery, this is something to do with the police. So a long whack of, you know, kind of advocacy with government officials to understand how CVE is a whole of society issue and needs a whole of society approach implementing these things. Um, in, in the toolkit, we talk about four different funding kind of mechanisms. And the first one, which is arguably the most important is around maximizing existing resources or structures or networks. So this relates back to my point where instead of creating a whole new structure, a whole new form, 
look at what exists already and see how you can integrate CVE into the agenda or to the mandate of that existing form or coordination committee. But also looking at in-kind donations and having specific uh, governments or civil society pick an action and then be really responsible for that action. See what they have existing in the yearly budget and how they move forward with it. Uh, some of the things we also did was hosting events and spaces provided in kind. This is probably one of the easiest ways you can do this. Instead of renting uh, a hotel with you know, a fancy lunch to have a meeting, look at different government buildings, community centers, you know, government and civil society offices, youth centers, education faith buildings. These are all spaces that can be provided by free with a little bit of uh, lobbying on your behalf. Also looking at catering, oftentimes uh, governments will have catering facilities and can provide catering at kind of discounted rates or even for free. Same with printing. Uh, media support, involving the media in, in an appropriate way, I should say, um, into your facilities and looking at social media and different free ways of kind of getting information out. Other free virtual platforms beyond social media that we often use and this was enhanced greatly actually during COVID. COVID made it a real struggle to do CV work, but it also meant that it became easier to get people interested in using virtual platforms like Zoom, Skype, um, using SurveyMonkey to conduct your evaluations. That's another free tool and WhatsApp. I think most of the kind of CV coordination local committees I've been involved in WhatsApp, especially during COVID, and this has accelerated and continued even when things reopened, is actually having all these meetings on WhatsApp um, or Telegram or another similar platform. Existing networks. So if your community already has a community of policing network or an interfaith network, women, youth, you name it, um, these are existing groups of people that you can tap into. And they themselves have the ability to reach great people and probably already have existing activities which might align with uh, what you're trying to achieve in the LAP. If a little bit of working together, you can see how you can reframe some of their activities to work um, in coordination with the LAP activities. Um, you know, there's other things like transport, if you have any buses or tech equipment uh, within your government offices, youth volunteer programs often exist. And finally, and I know um, a lot of people on this call would not like this one, but waiving of government stipends for participation events, because that can often really bog down budgets and um, make it difficult to hold events with those expensive stipends. The second area we talk about is around budgets and funds and what it already exists. So not donor funded, but local or national budgets. And this is where the need to have political will to raise the importance of CVE is really important so that we can understand where existing government priorities align with what the LAP is trying to do and identify areas of collaboration. Make sure though that if you're doing this to align your work planning with the budget cycle and identify those key stakeholders, perhaps it's someone in your Department of Treasury Perhaps it's someone within um, the police service at that level. You know, there, there's a whole different ways to do this and you will know your individual kind of gatekeepers and stakeholders best, but just make sure that any work planning is kind of aligned with these budget cycles so that it's able to be integrated and those priorities can be converged. Oftentimes there's national level funding as well. So if you have decentralization policies or devolution funds that can be accessed at the local level, you know, you can see by lobbying the relevant ministry or your member of parliament or other uh, representatives to gain access to these funds. And oftentimes they're about different things. So it's a bit of identifying the funds, but then also identifying what of your actions could uh, benefit from use of these funds. And looking at existing local funds, you know, if you have a youth entrepreneurship program, uh, this could be a great one. We had some colleagues in Nakuru who worked with youth groups from vulnerable communities, uh, registered a youth group formally, helped them get bank accounts, and helped them with the applications to these funds so that they were actually able to gain access to it. Because we found that while these funds exist, oftentimes it's not your most vulnerable individuals who are able to access them due to barriers like registration and bank accounts um, or literacy. 
course, there's also kind of technical and vocational programs or TVET programs, and seeing how you can reframe those to be more effective and reach vulnerable youth. An example from Quali County was that previously a lot of the TVET programs have been focused around more traditional job skills like fishing or handicrafts, but this isn't what the youth are interested in. Quali has a large tourism sector and people want to learn tourism skills and language skills. So by shaping that and shifting, the TVET program became much more useful and was able to employ uh, more young people who potentially were at risk of um, being vulnerable to extremist messages. Then um, finally, there's different kind of funds, and this relates a bit to decentralization funds, but one of our partners, Midriff Hurinet in Nakuru, worked with uh, Bondeni Police Station, which is in one of the most kind of hotspot areas, I would say, in the Kuru town, to get national funding from the police service to refurbish the police station so that it was upgraded um, with working toilets. There was a child-friendly room for those reporting domestic violence and other kind of amenities that made it more kind of client-friendly and focused. And this created a lot more cohesion and trust between the community and the police in an area where there was a long history of mistrust between the community and the police. Um, with the same police station, another one of our partners, Yves Bilonoma, uh, convinced the police to actually sponsor and pay some of the youth groups that they had been working with to paint mural, uh, COVID-related murals um, and repaint the police station. So there was an employment incentive and again, some trust building exercises between vulnerable young people um, and the security services. The third area is around private sector. And the challenge with the private sector is the private sector doesn't really see peace and security or CVE as a priority for them. So this is where you know, your launch events, so your communications really do need to contain that large range of stakeholders, including private sectors, so that they understand the importance of this work and also their role and how this impacts their businesses themselves. So, you know, attending um, representatives at any local business forums is really important. Some examples of how we did this, uh, again from Nakuru, one of our partners, Yves Bilanoma, worked with local business owners to give vulnerable youth who had, they have been counseling internships at shops and local businesses. About 95% of these youth were then employed by the local businesses afterwards because they saw what great work it was going back into the community. An example from Quale is one of the mining companies supported some youth activities with vulnerable youth, especially around micro businesses and internships. And another final example is from northern eastern Kenya, where the private sector yes. was quite involved in the peace and dialogue activities by donating food and supplies at the negotiations. The final part we mentioned is about donor funding, and I'm actually not going to say much on that because I think everyone kind of understands where that donor funding comes from. Yes. But the only thing I'll say is need to coordinate it because so many activities end up being duplicated um, and it just becomes ineffective. So that's all I'll say on donor funding. Okay. All right. That's very good. Um, thank you again for the importance that um, these local action plans uh, actions they need to be mainstreamed into existing resources as much as, as possible. So you have to maximize your existing resources, network structures, you have to utilize uh, uh, you know, local or national funds, uh, the importance of the private sector, how do you generate private sector support, and then accessing donor <clears throat> and, and, and obviously um, trying to manage that. So that would take me to, uh, to Iman. Um, and uh, Iman, Tunisia has made you know, significant progress uh, detecting and, and preventing uh, terrorist attacks, like the 2015 assaults on the Bardo National Museum, like the, what happened at the, the beach in Sousse Resort, and then in 2016 in Bangor Dam, right? So Tunisia managed to recalibrate its defense strategy and counterterrorism force structure as part of a multi-layered approach to security. Importantly, the Tunisian government also beefed up its counterterrorism architecture with the creation of the National Commission to Fight Against Terrorism. They adopted a national strategy to counter terrorism. <clears throat> so 
So search for common grounds where, where your account, country director is among the pioneers who have worked on CDE you know, in Tunisia uh, with a very participatory approach with local communities. So you manage to integrate the various stakeholders at the local level. I think you work hard to build bridges with public institutions and ministries. So, so Iman, can you describe to us the Tunisian experience in localizing you know, its CVE national action plan and how did they integrate local priorities with national needs? Merci beaucoup, Anwar. Merci beaucoup, à Patricia. Thank you so much, Anwar and Patricia. In listening to all the speakers, I realize more and more the similarities between our reality and our fight and our missions, in spite of the differences in local specific specifics. Tunisia, yes, uh, was a victim of terrible extreme violence after a very long period of 10 years of stability, we had multiple attacks. We had to put into place and develop a national strategy in a fight against um, extreme violence, violent extremism. And the approach in Tunisia is a little different because after the uh, development of this national strategy, there was a uh, development of a sectorial plan. So sectorial plans through the different uh, ministries, they took into account the, uh, they, uh, the, they had representatives of local and national groups. And, but that was not exactly local action plans. Local action plans, I think, are, are uh, initiatives of civil society to strengthen the resilience of the local community. These are initiative action, citizen action initiatives with holistic approaches in collaboration, of course, with the departments and representatives of the government. Uh, both at the local and the uh, national level. So uh, Search for Common Ground opened an office after uh, the regime, the, the, uh, the 2011 um, change of the regime. The interpreter, uh, the sound has been cut off for a moment. OK, merci, je m'excuse. Uh, alors, donc, le bureau de la Tunisie s'est force. Hey, sorry, so um, Tunisia has had to create lasting peace by providing the tools needed to work together to find constructive solutions. So the program strategies at Search for Common Ground, which wants to build this community resilience to confront violent extremism, are based on three pillars. The first is to increase citizen participation in local governments and national governance. So this pillar, this objective was search for common ground is achieving this through the support and strengthening of trust between security forces and civil society and citizens, particularly young people through a reform of the security sector for more effectiveness and transparency in this sector. There's a large national project uh, on local policing at Search for Common Ground, especially in terms of community dialogue uh, to create the bases for community dialogue, including civil societies, media, various participants. Another way is engaging, getting participation of young people through initiatives related to citizenship, including their participation in elections through various electoral processes, especially weaving links between young people and youth associations and local officials. So these are 
local level collaborative efforts. So we want to increase the engagement of young people in democratic electoral processes. We have a program called I'm the President, and it's a simulation of presidential elections. And this project showed that there is the possibility of fostering new leadership and create more trust in in young among young people. Another pillar has to do with the transformation of violent extremism in several sectors, particularly corrections. Um, so the management administration of prisons and the corrections system is another place, another sector where we can make reform uh, by improving human rights and getting social or civil society involved. So this is another area, another sector where uh, we've had f a four year program where we've had several capacity strengthening uh, projects uh, to improve community resilience. Another issue is preventing young people from getting involved in violent extremism. And we do that through strengthening mechanisms, strengthening uh, protective measures um, to help people who are in some trouble with the law, and you know, in Tunisia, we have anti-drug laws uh, and our penalties are really severe. So we have young people who have been somewhat victimized by these situations. And so they've been taking drugs and because of the penalties, their lives are really destroyed. So they've become easily the prey of uh, recruiters for violent extremist groups. So. Uh, hard to reach vulnerable groups during the health crisis has an, been another uh, access. So uh, the, we've been working to address people who represent 30% of people who are 30% uh, of the total number of young people who have been denied access to various programs. Uh, these are another vulnerable group. So particularly during the COVID crisis. Uh, so we have this third pillar, which is about promoting institutionalization of peace education by creating a national peace education program um, that was done with the national education minister. And this project works with young people and not so young people uh, in, in private schools, public schools. So uh, perhaps I will present that in further detail later. So our approach in terms of implementing our projects has been the detection of champions, champions in government departments among elected officials on the local level, finding those champions in communities and sectors that might be marginalized young people, but they can be leaders, champions who will lead the example for others. So creating networks of collaborative work between all of the actors at the local level created trust, trust spaces for dialogue where young people and communities can uh, have discussions in a safe space. Uh, we can even go to people's homes to discuss these issues with young people. Uh, and then of course, monitoring and evaluation of all of our actions in partnership with public authorities, with local associations, associations, local media, and our youth champions. So that's just a little presentation of what we're doing in Tunisia to counter violent extremism. Uh, amen. Uh, so Tunisia does not have a local action plan, but it's important that it, you know, it has a national strategy that was translated into sectoral action plans and how you describe civil society, how it has initiated this process of community initiatives. 
part of that first pillar of the national strategy, which is prevention in collaboration with public institutions, you know, with, <clears throat> with municipalities here. Uh, so that takes me to the second question, based on your experience in participatory approach with local communities, as you discussed them, you and others, I mean, can you share some of the challenges that confronted the implementation of these locally based CVE projects or programs? And if you can provide some examples. Oui. Uh, au fait, je vais... Yes, so let me start with the local context in Tunisia. What Tunisia has been experiencing for about 10 years, we've had a democratic transition. We have gone through the worst economic crisis since the fall of Ben Ali and the events of the 25th of July and, um, and September 21 and the power crisis of our current president, the dissolution of parliament. And since the last two the last two days, we've had um, dissolution of the Supreme Court. So this is the context. So these represent serious risks. Why am I talking about these issues? Because a comparable context with the serious crisis in terms of the economy can only increase recruiting of young people by violent extremist groups. So uh, lack of human rights, legal rights, leave young people powerless. And there's not much public authorities can do uh, when this goes on for such a long time. So this leads to a kind of a social exclusion uh, and economic exclusion of young people. This leads to a climate that encourages recruiting of young people by extremists. So when we have the return of foreign fighters to Tunisia, uh, political social marginalization, economic deprivation, uh, all the things that we've experienced, inequalities between the various regions of the country, all of this leads to numerous challenges on a local level for implementing an action plan, or as I was saying, for implementing initiatives on a local level to prevent, to transform violent extremism. Among these challenges, I could cite the lack of coordination between the national level and the local level in terms of local authorities, uh, lack of coordination between the various ministers or ministries, even at the local level. Everybody's working on their own thing with their own sectoral program that's very boxed in without coordinating with other partners. So this encourages duplication of initiatives and actions. So we uh, uh, lose in terms of financing. We also have an lack of information. <clears throat> so about the measures the government's taken, so we have a lack of training of local actors. So we have uninvolved in different local representatives in terms of countering and transforming uh, these threats. So we have the problem of communication, uh, in terms of the relation between the various local actors, a lack of trust between citizens and especially young people and um, public authorities. So we really have to have a long period of time to rebuild trust, to lay the cornerstones for a new society based on trust. So we of course have monitoring evaluation issues and the lack of acceptance of tools that have been built by civil society. We have a problem of identification and representation of partners, and that's getting worse with the non-acceptance of initiatives by civil society. Uh, uh, the identification of local champions, um, these champions aren't always accepted by other uh, actors. 
So of course, financial pressures are an issue, vulnerable communities. Uh, so lacking in, in the infrastructure location to do work, all of these issues, a lack of lack of trust I've already mentioned, but it bears repeating. Uh, this is a real challenge. The absence of safe spaces for dialogue at a local level, uh, lack of um, of esteem for ad administrations uh, in terms of local initiatives. So we have intergenerational conflict, and this is getting worse. Uh, and it's making this lack of trust worse. So this discourse of hatred is contributing to the fracture of local communities. We have conflicts that have been that have been smoldering for generations and decades. So it's difficult to ensure the involvement of communities in order to prevent young people from being recruited. So these are just some of the challenges. I'm sorry. Thank you again for talking about the democratic backslide and the economic uh, crisis, the exclusion of youth. I mean, how obviously that fuels uh, violent <clears throat> extremism and complicate the work that, that, you, that you do. Uh, talks about the persistence of barriers to collaboration, which again compounds the lack of understanding to national and local <clears throat> actors, government, non-government actors, law enforcement and local communities. And you highlighted several other problems, the problem of training local actors, the communication problem, um, monitoring, evaluation, et cetera. And finally, the, the last question, and if we can be obviously brief here, you know, if you can share with, with the participants some of the key lessons learned, including funding for effective implementation of the, the CDE action plan. Uh, oui, uh, pour le financement, en fait, yes, in terms of financing, thanks to the donors and the international cooperation, we have been able to uh, have access to financing and uh, also allow the ministries to access international financing. There's an entire group that, fi that is financing these initiatives uh seeing uh the urgent uh, uh needs the uh including the uh curriculum uh, peace curriculum that is financed by the uh, international community uh intercommunity dialogues between security forces and youth there are initiatives that are financed uh by the international community and there is also innovation. We really are counting on innovative means of financing by local associations that are managing the financing that are, are, are proving themselves to have um, exemplary uh, efficiency and efficacy and finding using new technologies that uh, that that, that bring down the, the costs, uh, the needs for financing. So it's important to use what already exists in the community. It could even uh, something from private, in private hands, it can be a farm, it can be a house of a family of one of the participants. It can be a public coffee shop. We are trying to minimize the cost, but for the actions that require financing and investing, we try to coordinate between the different uh, stakeholders and initiate uh, a coordination between the various partners on a local level. Also, the private uh, public partnerships with, with uh, taking into account social responsibility. This is also of great assistance. The principal uh, and most important thing is to reinforce these relationships with the donors, with the government, with the private sector, and with citizens. I believe, and I think it's this is a recommendation in terms of collaboration and coordination between the donors themselves to not duplicate their initiatives, 
and to not lose uh, uh, that money is not be lost, especially at the local levels to strengthen uh, the ability of local participants to find ways to uh, minimize local costs, for example, between the uh, security forces and uh, um, and the youth initiatives to have a dialogue established between these groups and to prevent violence in uh, games, uh, for example, at the arenas, the sports arenas, and the security forces uh, used their, um, used, worked with the youth in these uh, sports arenas, arenas to initiate dialogue. And now we have a very strong collaboration between the youth and the security forces. And this did not take a lot of money, but it took a lot of energy and human investment. Again, you did a terrific job, you know, describing the Tunisian uh, experience and, and, and this participatory approach uh, that your organization and others obviously are leading with local communities and talked about how you integrate the various stakeholders at the local level, at the national level, you know, uh, how to build bridges between public institutions, ministries, the private sector, you know, donors, uh, civil society and the communities. And you emphasize again and again, you know, the importance of trust, 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 uh, uh, which, is, which, is, which is critical. So with that, I'll go to, to Kimi, <clears throat> now to the Nigerian uh, experience. Uh, Kimi in Nigeria is, is one of only a handful of African countries to have developed policies or strategies you know, which encompass some elements of local CVE action plans. I mean, yourself, you assisted Mercy Corps some years back in developing their CVE plan for a Borno state. So based on, on, on your long experience working on CVE issues and your experience in Borno state, can you share with the participants you know, the process of developing this particular local CVE action plan? And how does it link to the national uh, counter uh, violent extremism policy? Thank you. <clears throat> and thanks for having me again. Um, first is to say that the um, process for developing the um, CVE framework or action plan for Bono State took, started in 2017. Oh, no, sorry, 2015, um, there was a meeting organized by Mercy Corps um, between the 13th and the 15th of December, 2015. And it was supported by the UK Depart Department for International Development as at that time. And at that meeting, we had um, representatives of government, different ministries, departments, and agencies of governments from Borno State at the meeting. So it was primarily donor driven. Um, and it wasn't too difficult to get the government representatives to be at the meeting. Um, however, it took us a while to be able to navigate the space of security, quote unquote, being the um, exclusive responsibility of the federal, because that's on the exclusive legislative list. And then you have the, the traction in which the Bonu um, framework was going to go, because you didn't want to step into the space of the federal government. Um, and at that time, the Office of the National Security Advisor had started consultations, I think, um, underground on the development of the counterterrorism strategy and even the preventing and countering violent extremism strategy, um, national action plan. So there were some feelings in some quarters that Bonu should wait while until the government, the federal government's um, action plan is in place. Um, and I remember, I think there was, we had some back and forth communication with some colleagues that were, um, that were opportuned to be closer to the corridors of power. And one of the angle that the, that the Bono strategy took was that it went through the development lens. So if you see the framework for Bono, 
you would see it addressing issues that were complementary to some initiatives that the federal government had set up at that time. So initiatives like the NPAR project, which was aimed at um, creating providing more jobs for young people, the creation of the three R's, the reconstruction, rehabilitation, resettlement ministry, um, looking at it through the lens of sport, looking at it through the lens of education, basically items that were on the concurrent legislative list, which allows the state and the government to walk around it. Um, after the plan, after the action plan was created, there was a bit of, um, I think there was like everything that is donor driven. It, there's a law, you know, um, Patricia um, said it earlier, the agenda of the donor is totally different from the agenda of the beneficiary, right? So at times once the donor has ticked the, bu uh, the box that it's been created, they most likely might not be too inclined in taking it a step forward. And if I remember correctly, colleagues that were handling the project at Mercy Corps, at DFID, there was a turnover. And then the process of developing the, pre um, of prevent of developing the national action plan for the federal government of Nigeria started. The um, grace I would say that we enjoyed at P1 is that we we were not going anywhere. Let me just put it like that. You're, you're not going anywhere. You're Nigerians, you're working within the space. So you engage multiple actors and you engage multiple platforms. So when we found out that the um, action plan for the government was being put together, we had the opportunity of sitting in different meetings and were able to put on the table some of the initiatives or some parts of the framework from the Bonu um, action plan. So if you look at the Bonu framework and you look at the um, fed, uh, at our national action plan, there are areas of similarities. So areas of similarities, one is the aim of the frameworks. What is it meant to achieve? And then the approach, which is supposed to be a whole of society, a whole of government approach. Um, however, the Bornu framework stressed more on resilience of the communities, whereas the national framework looked more at um, security, safety, um, from the technical traditional approach and the main, the main actors are the justice and security um, agencies. Coordination, yes, at the heart of both um, frameworks, um, but coordination for the Bono framework was put on the table of state government, civil society organizations, NGOs, media, and similar um, organizations. Where they also align is, um, is on the push, pull, and resiliency factors. So there were similarities in identifying the push and pull um, factors within um, both um, frameworks. And finally, the focus of the frameworks were similar. So at the level of aim, the push and pull factors and the focus, there were similarities. However, there were differences also. Absolutely, so similarities in terms of aim, approach, the whole of government approach, whole of society approach, and how do you diagnose the problem of violent extremism, the push and pull factors, but there were differences, as you said, national focus on security safety, ministries involved, justice sector, uh, justice interior, uh, while at the local level, it was more focused on, on resilience. But it was interesting that I emphasized the focus, the plan should flow from and be consistent with the international framework. Interesting as well how the drive started at the local level before the state had even developed its national strategy. So the second question, it's one thing to have a good plan, right? But it's daunting task to implement such a plan. So can you share with the participants again some of the challenges encountered in trying to implement this Borno state plan 
and how such challenges were overcome. First of all, the main challenge was getting it beyond the meeting and getting to the point of implementation, real implementation. And that was the, I mean, even for the um, donors, once the donors were not interested in it, it was difficult to push for implementation. Um, series of advocacy to the then newly established Ministry of RRR, Triple R, uh, to take on board um, the action plan and break it down as a demand or have it like a, like a to-do list, you know, that would guide their work, guide their interventions and guide their engagement with other donors um, subsequently was also a bit of a struggle. And that is because the ownership was not there from inception because it was not seen as something that was owned by the Bornu state government. It was seen as something that was brought by Mercy Corps and DFID. And they attended the meetings because they were asked to attend the meetings. And that was it, you know. The genuine buying on the part of those that were going to implement was not there. However, Mercy Corps tried its best at that time to follow up with implementation. So some part of the action plan was developed, was phased yearly as an, as an annual plan. Um, and some of it involved um, maybe organizing um, football matches, for example, between vulnerable youth population and police officers to kind of build, bridge the gap between them. And the materials that were used for the football matches carried peace messages in the local dialect. So even the football itself was branded and had peace messages in Kanuri language. The jerseys that the young boys wore had their names. Some of them had the colors of their international football um, um, stars and the numbers their stars um, wore with the language. Um, they also went as far as trying to reach out to reach out to women, yeah, within the communities to see women as as carriers of peace messages. And they did this by having some form of community dialogues or community. Um, we we'll call it. Um, round table or market square or town or village square meetings with the women and then came up with wrappers that had that were branded and carried the peace messages hijabs that were branded and carried the peace messages so once you use this materials you are propagating the um, peace um, messages i should say that i think one of the one Thing that was missed in Bornu was to have looked at the way the Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan was localized in the state. The state was, I think, the first to have a state action plan from the National Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan. And that lesson was not transferred to the CVE, maybe because again, the thinking that CVE is security, it's safety, and that it's the responsibility, the primary responsibility of the government is to provide for the safety and security of its state. Um, the second challenge is that there was a change. When I talk of change of government, when I talk change, change, um, um, change in the civil society space between the development partners and the INGO, even within the state, within Bornu state, again, there was, they had elections, we had elections in country. So the government in power changed. And naturally when the government changes, the people, mean, uh, commissioners will change, new heads of departments. So continuity is was a challenge continuity was basically a challenge lack of buying was was there continuity was a challenge but i'll say that i find some of my colleagues that we worked together some of them have carried the bono action plan and they have owned it within their organizations 
and it's been used as programmatic documents to other donors and receiving funding from other donors to implement across. But what this has done is that it's been, it's been implemented in piecemeal and nobody is looking at it together. Patricia said that some of some people, some of the parts of it are being implemented, some consciously, some unconsciously, but there's nobody looking at it at the strategic level to say, this is what it looks like. And even if, it, even if you're not looking at it through the lens of the Bono framework, maybe because you don't know it exists or it existed, but there is a national action plan, but how is this feeding into the national action plan and how are we contributing into, you know, um, implementing the national action plan? That strategic level of engagement or discussion, I don't think it's it's going on right now. Yeah, excellent, excellent points you're, you're making there. Again, the emphasis on, on ownership. Um, that's why these plans they should enable greater local ownership. That ensures, obviously, <clears throat> the building up of that approach you talked about, community uh, resilience. That's why Patricia talked about that yearly work plan. We talked about the term turnovers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to have a yearly work plan to account for you know, uh, differences and changes in those coordinated structures. So that takes me to the third question, uh, and I'm mindful of, of uh, people's time uh, again. So uh, based on your experience, and this links up to the second question, can you elaborate a bit on the lessons learned from Buono State and conditions or tools that are necessary for successfully implementing local CBE strategies in Nigeria? Again, you addressed some of those. Okay, um, four, and I'll distill it from what I've said earlier. Yeah. One, donor driven, because mm -hmm. it's donor driven, it's not, there is no long term commitment to see the implementation through. Um, lack of ownership which is closely linked to the donor agenda. Um, and I, I say this when I have the opportunity to, um, particularly when I'm engaging with policymakers or some of, our, um, some of our colleagues that work in this space, is that when a donor brings you an item, you do not have to take it. You need to look at it within, the, within your own context and see how it fits for purpose. Because it's a negotiate, it should be a negotiating process so that you're not just taking something you do not need, but it should be there to complement you and help you achieve your own goal. Two, the disconnect, which it links to the disconnect between the donor agenda and the agenda of the country and the agenda of the federating unit. So again, one needs to understand federalism is not a homogeneous framework. So you, one needs to understand how the federating system works in Nigeria. So um, unlike the US, where it was a situation whereby the states came up with the federating unit. In our own system, the federating units kind of came up with the states. However, it's a, it's, at times we look unitary, at times we look federate, we look like a federalism. I, I say we're hybrid. You know, so you need to know where we are so that we can come together and then you can engage the process and it would have an impact on the life of the people, which is the primary aim of any intervention. Then advantage is for groups is groups like ours that are in existence that work on these issues that can see through that we follow through posts. Um, donors, post-government, and it's a long-term, we're on, we on it for a marathon, not a sprint. So you see us following the dialogues as the opportunities come and continuing government. So when there's a change of government, at most times there's no continuity. So how do we feed continuity into the agenda of government, or maybe it should be to the agenda of political parties. So when they are there, they drive the agenda. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Again, uh, uh, excellent, uh, excellent points you you uh, you made. This brings us to the end of, of this part of the discussion. Again, there is not one size fits all template for the development of action plans, and, and naturally, not all countries, municipalities, or states need to develop local action plans to see the 
Uh, but there are, however, key principles and considerations which should be part of any successful local action plan or initiative or program. And, and as you all emphasize the Nigerian experience, the Tunisian experience, the Kenyan experience, this must be rooted in a whole of society, whole of government, whole of city approach that is multi-sectoral, that is evidence-based, that is community-led with the local government playing a coordinated role. We must also be financially uh, uh, su sustainable. That's why local action plans must have a clear goal and attainable outcomes. And it must be embedded in you know, existing policy frameworks, in local legislation or national legislation. 